And there we are. Welcome once again to another episode of Legends of the Drowned Isles, a homebrew fifth ed D&D campaign. I'm the host and GM. I'm Mark the Encaffeinated One. This is Campaign 2, The Great Confusion, set uh, in the distant past of the world that was known before the world of Amisha 1,000 years ago, in a time of uncertainty and change. Uh, my uh, players are here, starting on my left with Silas. Hi, my name is Pat. I'm playing Silas Marsh, magically expert swimmer. Hi, uh, I'm Marie, and I'm playing Annie, who can can swim. That's it. <laughs> and I'm Nax, and I'm playing Medric, half orc cleric. There's currently uh, magical printer sounds going on in the background, but pay no pay no attention to that. <laughs> magical printer. Okay, uh, even better. Well, to catch you up on what happened, here's a bit of a recap of a uh, a pretty, I would say, big fight that happened, uh, the culmination. After the group had had the chance to recover from the battle so far, a stray mention of the name Taraz seemed to provoke a reaction from the room around. The walls shifted, revealing what appeared to be eyes. One pair of these in particular glowed with red power, but despite attempts, could not easily be disabled. Fearing that whatever surprise they might have had was gone, they nonetheless continued on, and were quickly met with another mismatched skeleton, much like the others, but this time having glowing red orbs for eyes as well. It took no offensive action, but instead pointed further down the hallway, indicating where they might go. They walked along, and it fell into step behind them, soon joined by another skeleton, this one without glowing eyes. After a short time, they were directed to open a door. Behind it, they found what seemed to be the center of all the noise, a broad space with a hooded being at the center of what appeared to be large spinning gears propped up on shafts. Clattering, thrumming magical energy manifested continually just to their right, running down a long tunnel that seemed to stretch as long as, one of, as, long as the building. As they watched, the figure adjusted something on top of one of the mechanisms in, on one of the gears, and it sunk down into the floor, sliding into place uh, into mechanisms within the floor itself. Beside the figure, they could see a large, oddly shaped crystal poised on magical energy and bound with metallic ropes to the other pillars. Flashes of bluish light emerged from it, and they all quickly concluded that it must be Regalesta's heart. Silas called out to the figure, asking if it was Clockwinder, but the response, heard directly in his head, was simply, Clockwinder is a useful tool. The figure then asked him, asked them why he felt the, sorry, asked him why they felt the need to barge in, and whether he, quote, wished to see the rebirth of the Titans. Relaying this to the others, Medric recognized the term Titan as one of an ancient myth, about a group of entities that once challenged the gods and were either destroyed or exiled. A third cog descended into the floor, and the figure asked Silas if he would join him and serve at his side, or continue to follow Mother Hydra and fall alongside her. In response, Silas moved quickly forward to strike at the heart, but found the area around it, including the figure and the cogs, to be shielded by magical energy. Taking that to be an answer, the figure gestured towards a pile of bones nearby. Small whirring sounds started within it, and it began to move menacingly toward them. The skeletons, which had escorted them, joined into the fray, and a battle was underway. When Silas managed to push through the barrier and stood face to face with the figure, now seen as a grinning skull beneath the robe, with hands covered with mechanical gloves, the figure cast a spell which shoved him out of the world for a while, and he found himself floating in an endless sea, the plain of infinite water. He could hear the mother calling to him at a distance, but struggled to maintain any sense of direction while he floated there. Meanwhile, the others fought back against the skeletons and the whirling pile of bones that threatened him, threatened them, all while taking shots at the figure and the heart. Annie realized that the shield itself was no longer protecting them, and the disrupted the figure with a well-placed arrow, soon also shattering Regalista's heart. Returning, Silas, from the plain. The energy in the, groom, in the room grew chaotic, and the room itself seemed to shift and turn into an uncontrolled fall. 
The machinery embedded in the wall seemed destined to tear itself to shreds, and the entire building seemed on the brink of collapse. The skull abandoned the rest of its body, now revealed to be a collection of mechanisms and bones, and fled through a small porthole. The group quickly made their way along, out the long tunnel at the center, slammed by shifting walls. Finally emerging, the group found themselves once more on the ocean floor with the collapsing rubble of the large building now more recognizable in shape as a colossal arm and a furiously churned up murky water. No sign of the sea devils and their accomplices could be seen, and the place they had just came from sunk into the soft sand behind them, shattered into rubble. Among this, they located the body of Regalesta. No longer a large, crystalline woman twice as tall as the average man, now resembling flesh and bone, still lithe and long, but with strange features. Her head was long and steeped, uh, steeply sloped back. Her face had hollow cheeks, and her nose was sunken in below the ridgeline, giving her a ghastly, inhuman appearance. Her skin was smooth but tanned gray. She had broad, pointed ears, not entirely unlike those of some kinds of elves. Her limbs seemed disproportionately long and thin, too, and her body was narrow. She lay there, unmoving, until Medric placed a few of the pieces that had been her heart next to her. These crumbled into dust, but seemed to give life to the body, although she remained unconscious, and now, choking on the water, she could no longer apparently breathe. They gathered up her body and swung swam quickly to the surface, although Silas refused to help. Above them, Ignis shone stri strongly, and they could just make out the town of Ailswater, much farther away than they had expected, just on the horizon. So a little bit of an adjustment from the description at the last of the previous episode, just because uh, I was getting pretty tired and needed to sum up at the end. But uh, Marius shone strongly, not Ignis. Um, Right. Oh, Marina, I forget. Uh, no, you're right. Uh, it was the, I mean, if it was Ignis, then great. That's perfect. <laughs> no, I was. I was but thinking I it was. It was midday, but it was actually uh, Marius. Thank you very much. Um, uh, actually, uh, Marina. Sorry, the larger of the two moons. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I want to stress is, after floating on the surface for a few seconds and looking around, you can see Elfwater. But it's almost below the horizon, indicating you're much farther out than you were when you first came out here. When you first came out, you were in the middle of the bay. Now you're in the open ocean, far beyond that. It does make a problem, because swimming that far would be very difficult. Now, there's something that's going to happen shortly, but I will give you an opportunity to react and discuss if you have anything to say to each other. Well, that was shitty. Yeah. Uh, is there like any floating wood anywhere? Swimming in full armor? Yeah. Uh, Still uh, furiously. Yeah. No, I look, no. looks at the two of them to see how they're doing with the swimming because they're not going to drown, but one of them's wearing 60 pounds of armor and the other one's wearing a big hooded cloak. Oh, I wouldn't have brought a cloak. Okay. I, I knew sense. we were going swimming. Yeah. I think probably, uh, although Medrick is, is considerably stronger, has a lot more work to do. And is kind yeah, because I was just thinking having... about that stuff too. Oh, and he was right. telling me. Right. Yeah. Uh, Regalesta is sort of, uh, I mean, the, the phrase is perhaps uh, unfortunate, but sort of dead man floating. Um, breathing on her own, but only barely. Not a flutter of eyelids since uh, uh, you guys started coming up. Uh, and is not moving. Uh, her skin is cold and clammy. Um, and again, there's a sort of very alien look to her face. You've seen her now in sort of th two other forms, and this is the third. First form was the sort of large crystalline woman, but it was difficult to really make out much detail um, to a certain degree. The crystal obscured all of that. The second was when she disguised herself as a sea elf. Um, and she had uh, kind of blue skin, but otherwise looked fairly like a normal elf, um, maybe slightly uh, uh, fluted ears, uh, a little bit uh, of an odd uh, look, but recognizably an elf. This one is much, much different. Um, I don't know how much you are familiar with the d, &D race, the Gith Yankee, or the Githzerai for that matter, but that is the model on which this character is made. 
So I've tried to describe it obliquely, but there, um, you can look up those uh, those species and get a better idea of of kind of what she looks like. Um, it's like tall, thin, uh, yeah, pointy ears. Yeah, they have a very odd uh, nose shape, which almost looks like the nose itself is kind of pushed in, and there's a very prominent ridge above it. Um, sometimes. It's How do you spell Gitzerai or? Um, G I T H and then mm -hmm. uh, Z E R A I. If you want to look it up, there's okay. technically two different um, two different species, if you will, within the same body form. Um, the Gith Yankee as well, but uh, I forget exactly how to how to spell Yankee. I don't think it's spelled like an American Yankee. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I, I had most of that except for my head. Cool. Yeah. Um, and so if you want to look that up, you'll get a better idea of the sort of body shape and how, how unusual it is. This is not a, a form which would be normal, uh, normally seen, I should say, around here. Um, there are a number of, of elves. There's uh, some uh, triton, which are, are a, a, sort of, a sort of sea elf, but they, they look actually a little bit more like um, sea devils, actually. But they're distinctly uh, different in form. They have legs and hands and sometimes a tail webbed hands but uh but for her it's it's very very different um the reason i say that only is that um she would stand out in town pretty clearly uh, as she is right now um as you're floating there kind of trying to contemplate what to do silas you're you're looking over and seeing that while you could probably swim that distance especially in in the the gifts that the mother has given you um of kind of a, a much more uh ingrained uh, sort of affinity for the sea. Um, and Annie is, is, uh, is dexterous, but this, this long a trip would wear both of them out. And you also know that there are sharks. Probably that, just sink to the bottom and walk. <laughs> um, well, the, the, the water breathing wouldn't last long enough if you were, were trying to walk. Damn it. Um, okay. But there are sharks that also swim in this water, and you all have wounds which are, are bleeding into it. Mm -hmm. whoa, whoa. but the water breathing will last uh another like 20 hours uh, it's a full day oh it's a full day but, okay. uh, um, i was thinking mm -hmm. it was much shorter than that uh but uh, even, day, yeah. uh but even then um it would take most of a day to walk back and all of you would be quite yeah. exhausted by then <clears throat> and also potentially under attack by by sharks who would sense the uh, the difficulty um but as you kind of lie there um, what thoughts are going through Silas's head that you'd care to share at the moment? Anything? Well, Silas is looking at with Medra and Regalata and he's he's thinking something. It's obvious he does he either doesn't trust or doesn't like her. But after a bit, uh, since Medric has, well, a lot of armor support in addition to a person, he will go and say, here, let me. And he'll shrug her onto his back, and then uh, he can stay there in the water. Okay. Thanks. Pfft, fucking steelers. Uh, He's disgusting. The, uh, <laughs> uh, the as you get that close, you also notice that she has several wounds, um, probably that continued on uh, after the attack or after trying to flee from those things. And you kind of imagine that if this transformation in her body is due to the destruction of the heart, she would still have been engaged with some of the sea devils at that time and probably Ooh. not able to keep away from them quite as much um, um she's clothed in i can cast a as long as my head is over above the water right uh actually you can breathe water so you can actually speak uh even right. even the water so i'll give her a uh, cure wounds okay um do you have any castings of sending left yeah because that might be the best way to get some help out would be to try to contact uh, the captain. Right. Uh, which captain? Right, Verndale, yeah. 
Okay. As you as you uh, call on the power of Ignis to heal her, little flashes of, of uh, fire close up some of the wounds. She doesn't seem to awaken, and you sort of recall that however metaphorical it might have been or however literal it might have been, her heart was destroyed. What that means now in this form, you're not really sure, but she does not waken. Does not seem to even stir. Great. Silas. The water seems to, to move around you, almost as though a small wave is sort of kicked up. And as you sort of instinctively turn that direction, you see something blocking the sight of the moon, something standing tall and majestic uh, just behind you, further out into the water. Uh, and it takes you a moment to sort of recognize the shape of a tree. And it <clears throat> sort of occurs to you. This is something you have seen before, and the story is well known. Um, Annie would have heard it a little bit in some of the talking she'd done in the town. Uh, Medric, uh, while it hadn't been mentioned by the Flamekeeper specifically, it would have been the, one of those stories that floats around from time to time. You probably wouldn't have heard much of it. But Silas, you're immediately familiar with the Lonely Tree Island. There is a small island, not much bigger than uh, uh, the, the floor of a small inn, in the center of that island grows a massive tree. It's a very, very old tree, nearly 50 feet around. And most people never see it. It's legendary because it seems to be here in what would be a high-trafficked area by ships. But most report nothing more than seeing it off at the distance, if they see it at all. But you made it here once. You needed a bit of privacy once. Privacy with Molly. At that point, you were still dating. And anywhere in town, you were bound to have the protective eyes of her father following you. Anywhere in the uh, village of your people, there seemed to be too many expectations and a lot of suspicious gazes in her direction. So finding a private place was important to you. You got out in a boat, some place that both of you loved. And found the tree and now for the second time you found it again it's only about a, a couple of dozen yards away easily swimmable distance you know that the base of the tree does cover over with water as the tides shift up and down but there is solid ground it's like one singular peak in the midst of all of this water you also know that large ships tend not to come near it because when the water covers over the roots, it also covers over the spikes of, of ground, which seem to be popping up here as well. And when the water does not cover the roots, it still is a dangerous uh, space, too large for any, uh, too small rather, for any sh uh, large ship to approach. But in the small dinghy you borrowed that day, you made it here. It might be a moment's peace. So is this a giant tree by itself or an island with a giant tree on it? It's a giant tree with an island that only has about 10 feet of spare ground on it. And that ground gets covered by water in high tides. The tree itself is over 100 and something feet tall, something like 150 feet tall. What you guys see this, right? We see it. Uh, as Silas points it out. Uh, it's it's strange because it's almost as though because you've seen where the moon is where where uh, Marina is until he points it out you really didn't notice and now that he's pointed it out it practically obscures the moon and you're not sure how you missed it before but yes That's hanging weird. high above you is this massive illusions. tree I'll try to touch the island is it an illusion or is it real Can you swim over to it uh, as you swim over, the, the water gets a little bit warmer, weirdly enough. And soon enough, you find yourself touching onto hard stone beneath the water and then sort of loose sand on top, which is, again, warmer than expected. The tree itself, uh, one way to imagine the tree, uh, it is sort of tall and broad around with multiple sort of rough um, curving uh trunks that seem almost connected together um, if you've ever seen a banyan tree that's the image to conjure up at the moment um, all 
Well, Silas will swim over and push Regalesta up on top of the sand. I'll, I'll join. How did yeah. you do that? Do what? Did this tree, it was, was it not your doom? No. It's a local story. Yeah, I vaguely. Because he knocks on the tree. Uh, it's solid. In fact, where you knock on the tree, you see a slight uh, curving and carving on the edge of it. Uh, essentially, S plus M in a heart. That's familiar. Molly and I were here once. I don't know why it appears, but we can rest here. And is that's good. We'll hop beside Regalesta and then get up and walk a short distance away. He just occasionally looks at her. Can anybody see this tree, or is it like magic in some way? Well, it's probably it's obviously magic, but if I call to Captain Verendel and tell him we're on this tree island, would it disappear before he got here? I don't know. I don't know if he'd even see it. Um... About 10 feet up are where the broad, large limbs of this tree start to move out. And the, the limbs themselves extend out even beyond the island. Um, while the first few um, sets of limbs don't have any foliage whatsoever, you can see uh, higher up that the tree still holds these broad green leaves. And strangely, what look like two different flowers. One, a very large, very delicate looking purple flower. The other one, smaller and uh, pink, almost like a, a, a cherry blossom. And as you look a little closer or stare a little bit at it, you can notice there are actually vines uh, wrapping around, and the vines are responsible for the smaller flower. You can see fruit hanging about 20 feet up in the tree. Looks kind of like an apple. Uh, looks kind of uh, orange-yellow, but has more of an apple shape and smooth skin. There also seem to be bunches of uh, large uh, oblong uh, would almost look like hairy coconuts, but are in the shape of almonds that seem to be gathered around some of the flowers. As you're watching, one of those drops down, and Medric, make a dexterity saving throw. Oh no! Bonk! <laughs> Indeed, the the uh, the thing sort of cracks over your head. Uh, cracking open slightly, and a little bit of, of uh, milky liquid pours out from inside. Uh, it's one point of damage, basically, bludgeoning damage, but uh, <laughs> you find that the, the, uh, the, where the wound is on your head and where the cracked open uh, uh, nut broke and the milk spilled over your head, the wound is closed instantly. So the one point is immediately gone. Make a perception. Yeah, that, should have, that should have left a mark, but it didn't. <laughs> I'm Do assuming I... the milk has spilled all over my face. Like I'll oh, yeah, it's still lick my face wherever the milk is. <laughs> it tastes quite sweet, actually. Sweet but thin. Do I know if anything is edible here? Or... You never had the fruit. It was always uh, either way too high up in the tree or wasn't any there. So with the cracked nut being on the floor, like, is there milk left in one of the halves? Or is it is there milk left in it at all? A little bit. And the inside flesh is uh, kind of uh, kind of a bluish white. I'll take a sip of it. Okay. It, it tastes uh, uh, sweet and bitter at the same time, weirdly enough. It has a sort of aftertaste that hangs on for a while. You regain one hit point. Woo! As you kind you of feel look a bit walk, around the, walk around the tree, you can see there are other small carvings, sometimes symbols, sometimes names. Um, there's one that looks like a, a sort of anchor, stylized anchor with a, uh, a carved chain around it. 
Uh, I'm not sure who's the, whose symbol that is, but probably a sailor symbol. Someone else who had wandered upon this place. They couldn't have brought their big ship, so they must have floated here, much like you did. How wide is the trunk of the tree? It's about 50 feet around. And uh, there are signs of of some, some lichen and moss growing down on the lower levels, indicating that water probably flows up onto it. You can see some, some larger burls going up the, the side of the tree, probably climbable. This fruit gives life. Does anybody need it? I'll hand out the uh, leftovers of the coconut milk. Or there isn't any milk, milk left. There was just like a, a, okay. a, a small swallow left in the, in the bottom of it. Um, there is the, the sort of flesh on the inside. Apple. Sorry, what was that? You said there's like an orange apple sort of About fruit? 20 feet up, yep. Okay, so not reachable. Um, Unless I can put it on my, I can put you on my shoulders and you can reach with your staff. I'm not standing on your shoulders 10 foot from the greeny, uh, from the briny deep. Well, I thought you could, you could swim easily in the briny deep. What's the, what's the matter? <laughs> yes, if I fall on your head and knock you out. Um, and there's plenty of try climbing it. Yeah. Some of those look close enough too. So, eh. Although I'm not much of a climber. I, I can try climbing. Okay. I'll lift Annie on my shoulders if she wants me to. <laughs> Some of the lowest uh, limbs are only about 10 feet up, and there are those burls as well, so you can make a, uh, a um, acrobatics or athletics check at advantage. Oh, yeah. You quickly shimmy up, and the the broad limbs that are on the lowest levels are um, almost as as uh, wide a, around uh, as you are. They are massive and seem quite solid, even though they sway slightly on a breeze that you can't feel yourself. Um, climbing up a few more levels, there's there's these deep, thick burls that almost form a, a step ladder, and you easily climb up to about well twenty feet uh, if you want to get just to those those bunches of the uh, the yellow orange al apples or apple like things um if i can grab them i'll drop them down uh but i'll stay up here and keep climbing up a little bit okay make a perception check and i'm assuming you give a little bit of warning with her throwing the apples down yep <laughs> They land with a sort of hollow thud on the, on the ground. As you're looking around, a couple of things come to come to uh, come to you. One, there's signs that some of the branches were broken off and kind of woven together, uh, almost in a, a, a pattern like a a, um, a bed or a canopy. Um, in a couple of sections, looks like someone stayed here for a period of time. The other thing you notice as you're pulling off some of the apples uh, is a slight sound of childish laughing. You make a dexterity saving throw with advantage as you see another one of these coconut-like things falling down towards you. Almost like somebody's throwing them at us. <laughs> Fifteen. Fifteen. Yep. You're able to kind of shift over to one side as the uh, the uh, almond coconut goes bouncing down the side, and along with the apples that you uh, that Annie's been throwing down, lands another one of those uh, those large nuts. Uh, this time unbroken, right by your feet, Medric. That I'll wasn't me. That. No worries. I think so. I, I saw. I wasn't here. You. I hear a laugh. Where are they falling from? What was that? I, I I say I hear laughing. Do I hear laughing? Not from down there, no. Okay. Usually laughing. What kind of laughing? Hmm. 
um, what Annie would probably describe it as is sort of a childish giggle. Not menacing. That doesn't make it any less uh, creepy. creepy. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably true. Childish laughter out of nowhere is creepy. <laughs> <laughs> But there seemed to be like beds or something up here, like people spent the night. Well, we might as well check it out. I don't know how long it's going to be before somebody comes. Uh, uh, Cover your ears. (laughs) Silas says to cover your ears. I'll cover my ears. Uh, he uses um, thaumaturgy to make his voice five times louder and uh, screams, uh, man overboard in the direction of the town. Okay. <laughs> it might reach. I don't know. I'll, I'll do ascending. Years, it's, it's pretty clear what he what he just said. And you can actually hear a little bit of an echoing off of the uh, northern part of the cove where the uh, the uh, Cape Raven uh, sits prominent, prominent out into the bay, um, so it it probably was heard everywhere. Mm-hmm. They'll hopefully check the bay. That's usually where men overboard are. Yeah. Annie, if yes. I were to magically contact somebody for them to come over here and rescue us, I only have enough power for one. Should I contact Captain Verindel, or would Gaetano be better suited? I don't know where Gaetano is. Hopefully he made it. If he got out where we were, then he might have a chance to get back to town. If not, then contacting... I would contact the captain because you can tell him that Gaetano's somewhere in the water and that we're on an island. Whereas if you contact Gaetano, he can't do anything. If he can't do anything. So I'll access the power of Ignis, whatever little bit I have left, and send a tweet to Captain Verindel. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) What is your message? We need your help. Or No, wait. Let me write it out first. That way I'm not going to like go back and forth a bunch of times. So it's going to start off with, we are in the bay. And I'm going to assume Magic, having been on ships before, like, knows how to give directions <laughs> in water. I mean, the basic compass directions would be sufficient at least to, to direct someone. Okay, so how many words would that take, um, roughly? For the directions? Yeah. I mean, let's say 10 words. Gives okay. a, a rough direction. Every five words after that to add to the direction, I'll say gives them a bonus. So we do need to make sure that we mention that Gaetano is somewhere. We're at 15 right now. We are at edge of bay. Directly east. Tree Island. Gaetano is in uh, water. Somewhere. Yeah, somewhere with another so that's 27 uh, yeah so well, right no, now, if we are in the bay 10 words for directions so that's at 15. so i got 10 more so gaetano somewhere no, okay so look for flying okay. gaetano somewhere in water and then the lonely tree island would be Okay. Sorry, my brain is processing. We would have three words left. Okay. Look for floating tree. Cano somewhere in water. We got. 
we got two words left, so I'm gonna add need need lift. Okay. <laughs> and boom, sent. Okay. Um, within a few seconds, there's the response coming back from uh, Verandel. Um, I suppose you are responsible for this spout going away. We'll look in on Gaetano and send a ship your way. All right, I just got a response. He'll look for Gaetano and send a ship our way. And I'm pretty sure he does realize that we're the ones who made the spout go away. Good. Finally, recognition. You're going to get a promotion, Annie. I don't even have a job. <laughs> I don't think I can get much more of a promotion. Not officially. <laughs> You're a lieutenant, Danny. Yay, demotion. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a captain? You can't be any higher than a lieutenant. Uh, I think wasn't the title special investigator? Yeah. yeah. So very special investigator would be the next level up. <laughs> so with that assurance, um, you have a feeling that it will take them considerable time to first of all get the ship ready to go and head out your way but at least you have some assurance that that will be on its way. Uh, as you uh, kind of look out towards Aelthwater, however, thinking you with your mind and projecting your thoughts outward, um, you do feel a bit of a breeze, and a fog starts to roll in, sort of turning and twisting around the tree, obscuring the bay from your sight, and obscuring the town as well. In front of well, you, Annie, coming from the tree... You hear a small voice, curious. Who are you? It sounds feminine and young. As you look forward, you see a pair of eyes looking out from the tree. Blue and a little bit of white. My name is Annie. We got stranded trying to help people. And stepping fully out of the tree... Um, appears to be a young woman uh, clothed in what looks to be, uh, I would say, vines and uh, leaves bound and twisted together, but not in a harsh way. It's almost as though they grew that way. Her skin is uh, deep blue with green tinges. Her ears are slightly pointed. She's shorter than you are uh, by quite a bit. But there's something about her which seems older than she might appear. You're safe here. You look trustworthy. And she smiles at you. Thank you. And your name is? I am Numpty. And I know you might be trustworthy. Because Azumunta let you near. It doesn't like a lot of people. Is a munta? Yes. And she pats the bark beside you fondly. They're quite old. I They've see. Seen so much. As have I. Not much longer, though. And why is that? All things pass in time. And while Azumunda has lasted for longer than most, it gets lonely here. As do I. That's what too bad. What brings you here? We were trying to save the, uh, to help the town and ended up stranded in water. You were trying to help. That must be why Azamunta let you near. They don't tell me everything. It keeps it interesting. And then a bright look 
and her eyes go wide. You've been outside. You've been places. You know stories. And there's a delight that comes into her voice. Will you tell me a story? All of you. What you kind of story us, would you like? Will you tell us stories of places we've never been? Some people come here and they don't say much at all. Some people have stories to tell. I like them the best. If you tell me stories, I think we can give you gifts. I see. Will you bring your friends here? Sure. And, and I'll go ahead. Uh, and I'll let them know. The the person up here wants to to listen to some stories. Oh shit. And Medrick right now is like, if it's a childlike voice, it's trying to think of any kind of story that's like child appropriate. <laughs> well, that's that makes the child vo uh, that makes the laughing, giggling less creepy. I don't really have much of an option. Let's. I mean, we might as well try to head up. Yep. He looks over at Medrick. Do you have any rope for? that I'm looking at my inventory because Silas has rope but it's on his it, he keeps that in his saddlebags which are not here and as you're kind it's of looking around you can question actually mark. hear the sound of growth as large vines that were wrapped around the upper part of the tree start to descend downward and start to curl around Regalesta. And Silas's head is a little meter going from creepy to non-creepy, and the needle is currently going back and forth in the middle. <laughs> yeah. Is it like, are they bringing Regalesta up? It seems to be grabbing around Regalista at the moment. It seems to be gingerly and gently sort of picking its way around her body. Uh, what, what's that doing? Who are you asking? Just in general. <laughs> Annie's 20 feet up in the tree at oh. the moment. But um, Annie, you can kind of see beside you the that Namti is, is sort of looking down, and kind of observing what's going on. Your friend can't walk. No, she, she's unconscious. We, we've been swimming her around to try to get her to shore. It's better to rest up here. The water flows in. There will be no ground soon. But there will Thank always you. be Azamunda. And as the vines kind of wind their way around her body, they start to lift her up into the trees. Well, now that I can see that it, that it's lifting her up like gently, then I'm going to be like not as concerned. Right, and what then I'll what's their attempt name? to climb up. Okay. Again, it's sort of an athletics or acrobatics role with advantage because there's handholds and plenty of opportunities. We're athletics. Kind of map in roll 20, so I'll switch to that map just to show you kind of the general area. And there'll be some communication coming through there. Okay, well. my first roll was a one. My second roll is a <laughs> So you're just about to fall. I like as you it. reach out for the, uh, the branch. Uh, it sort of sways a little into your direction, landing directly into your hand. I mean, the first roll was a one. And I'm a little to dodge the equipment. <laughs> oh, I, I thought you meant with the advantage you have now. No. Uh, it seems to be fairly easy to climb. And actually, I will put her onto the center. I don't quite have the right um, 
Don't quite have the right icon for Namti, but this is one of the ways she would appear. If I can do this properly. There we go. You should see her toward the top. Now, the, the sparsity of this map does not reflect the sparsity of the tree itself. It's just meant to be slightly representative. Those large, broad limbs are the ones that are about 10 feet up. And as you can, as I said, they, they extend far out beyond the edge of the island itself, um, which is mostly uh, gra uh, gravel and sand. Um, and then the, as you go up further and further, there are uh, more and more limbs, and it's full of foliage after about, uh, after about 20 feet, um, where those, those base level fruit are. And is, uh, okay. And after a little bit of effort, uh, again, sort of helped by the tree itself, um, you find your, your footing, uh, Silas, and manage to, to meander up as well. So let me get my lists here. Um, and all of you see this, this lithe and comfortable creature. Um, you actually realize that the eyes are bigger than you might expect. Um, and maybe it's because she's staring at you with wonder and delight, or maybe it's because they've seen everything here. It's hard to say, but they're unblinking and watching you. Um, and occasionally sort of leaning into and almost caressing the surface of the bark of the tree, um, like an old friend that's there. I am Numpty. Who are you? And points at Medric. Hey, I'm Medric, cleric of Ignis. Ah, the sun is necessary and shines down its warmth upon us all, if sometimes it can be a little jealous, especially of the water. I'll just kind of raise an eyebrow, because do I know what she's talking about? Um, you can make a religion roll. All right, let's do that. No. I'll just say, I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it sounds sort of vaguely um, like something you learned in a lesson, but you're not able to recall what that might be. And then there's maybe a, a, a small pang as you realize the Flame Keeper's not here to ask. Yeah. As well. Uh, and seeing that, she sort of reaches forward and, and puts her hand on your on your arm. Don't worry. The sun will always be here. The fire will always burn. It will. Kind of nods and smiles. And you? She turns to Silas. My name is Silas Marsh. <coughs> Excuse me. I sense the touch of something old with you. Something I've seen before. Zagwatha. Does she touch you? Does she bless you? Is this my first time hearing the word Zagwatha? Yes. Okay. Yes, I think it is. I so want to say, show me on the doll where Zagwatha touched you, but uh, no. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I did say I wanted to. So. Um, uh, he said, yes, I call her another name, but she is known as Zagwatha as well. She has had many names and many followers. She scares many people, but I've seen some of her heart. She scares Ignis, too. But that's his problem. Just inside, Silas is going, yes! <laughs> I'm just like this. Um, Do I recognize the name Zagwatha at all? Uh, you can make a religion check on that as well. Or history. Hopefully I roll higher than a t history. Oh, no. Religion or history or just religion? Or religion or history. Okay. Let's go with religion. 13. Okay. It, it has a, a very old sounding form to it. Um. There's there's something about the the, the, the structure of the word um, that has a let's just say an otherworldly feel to it. 
while you can't really put your finger on it, there's something more to that than than you had felt before. Um, when called Mother Hydra or just the mother by uh, Silas, um, it had given a very, well, literally matriarchal uh, position. Uh, but now it feels like some sort of creature. And again, you're not really sure, but it might be something you can look up in the archives or you can talk to another Ignian uh, who might have the full, the full story. But it's it's something mm-hmm. which which resonates, but you're not sure why. Yeah, and if this uh, numpty person says that Ignis is afraid of it, like yeah, I'm definitely gonna Google that later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would um, be uh, Ignoogle or <laughs> uh, something to make note of. Actually, would be now that. Um, Medric has the ability to do sending. Uh, he p- remembers his trainers and the others in the church. He might be able yeah. to actually contact them for inration. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I just can't do any more sendings right now. <laughs> and it, yeah. and it, it's it's pretty much Twitter too. So it's like very short conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she bends down, and yeah. now the the um, vines have laid Regalesta into sort of a comfortable. Uh, pose down on one of the broad, large limbs, and they they sort of retreat. Little buds of flowers appear on them. Um, kind of the bigger blue flowers appear uh, as they retreat. And Numpty kind of kneels down to her uh, and says, uh, "I have not seen one like her in a long time. I've not seen time. one like her ever until today. Anyway, she was different when we first went in the water." She's lost something. And she kind of brushes her hair aside, uh, Regalesta's hair aside gently. Her heart and her crystals. Do I have any more of the heart crystals with me, or did they all crumble into dust? I don't think you put all in there, so you have a few more, but they don't have the same light in them now that they've sort of broken apart. Yeah. She was twice as tall as she is now, and she was made of crystal... The sea devils took her heart, or had her heart anyway. We tried to get it back, but some, I'm not going to say the name. This evil creature was making use of it, so we had to destroy the heart. But we managed to pick up a few pieces of what's left, and I'll show her the pieces. And she kind of looks. Yeah, she's... And I had a pocket full as well. What? Yeah. Right. I, I tried healing her, yeah, and it doesn't seem to have done anything. I thought she was dead, but guards next to her. They crumbled into dust, and she came back consciousness briefly. It may have been better for her if she had, if she had stayed. I can't leave an ally behind. We wouldn't have been able to get as far as we did with this if she hadn't joined us, if she hadn't helped. She's one of the things (laughs) we're here to get rid of. What? It's obvious she's from whatever this thing is that no one can remember, that she herself could not remember. These are the things we're supposed to get rid of and take care of. What do you think? He almost says, Catherine, he says, our thing. Now I can't think of a word for it. Um, technically boss, but boss kind of has the wrong patron or something. Yeah, that's it. Um, what do you think our patron is going? Uh, would want us to do? Well, if she can't remember what happened, then where's the harm? Silas has looked down at her and... Maybe. I'm not about to not save an ally. Regardless of what ends up happening, she helped us. 
Silas does look more chastened than you normally expect. You're uh, saved her first. Then whatever we have to do, we have to do. I'm sorry. We destroyed the heart, so Vay's guy can't use it to its nefarious ends anymore. I wish we would I wish we would have been able to kill him, honestly. I don't think there's any chance we could have. I'm sure we'll meet again. Yes. We need to find a way to to deal with him. I the way he was moving between bodies. I don't think the I don't think the real him was ever there. I don't think that's his skull that flew off. It's just a convenient container. We have to find some way to deal with something that it's probably just a spirit. An extremely yeah. powerful one. Hey, Numsi, do you know anything of, uh, does anybody have a piece of paper? <laughs> Not in the water. Although I do, I do pull out the sandwiches, which were wrapped in oil cloth, so they're still somewhat dry. And I hand them around. <laughs> Lunch. I, I can't, I can't write on a sandwich. <laughs> you can eat a sandwich. <laughs> well, yes, but. So you have a piece of paper. I, I, want I have a sandwich. It's the weirdest <laughs> response ever. If anyone is carrying parchment, that might work. I don't know if it's as vulnerable to water. I mean, parchment would have to dry off still to be used as as a, as a writing surface. It isn't disintegrate like paper might, but it is made of animal hide. But anyway, uh, there was this. Powerful conqueror, ruler in Athlon. Thousands of years ago, Ooh, actually, we know his I name. Know. But if we say his name, I'll write it down in my in my uh, book of shadows while he's talking. Oh, jeez. Uh, but okay. But if we say his name, then bad things happen. Or at least the last time I said his name, bad things happen. So I don't want to say it again. Can we call him Mister D? <laughs> <laughs> Numpty's kind of nodding along and taking you very seriously and looking straight at you. Still unblinking. It's a little unnerving. Um, she puts her hand again on the on the central uh, spine of the tree and then tilts her head as if, as if listening. We remember a long time ago. A very long time ago. Longer still than what has recently happened, which itself is a long time ago. The world has shifted. It was in a hurry. But I think I might know who you mean. There have been people who've tried to conquer everything. And they almost did. The same guy that tried to challenge the gods and kill them? Who did? There were many that died. Wow. Ignis is forever. Initials T N D. And she kind of nods sadly. As Amunda remembers. It was a terrible time. And so much was fractured then. And so much has been fractured now. You mean the Great Infusion? Is that what you call it? There well, yes, because things... we can't remember anything. There are things passing from the world. And she looks sadly at the, the bark in her hands. As will we soon. It's a time for new things. Is your... My, what's happening? Is the tree sick? Or... The tree remembers. 
The tree remembers everything for a long, long time. But now, now is the time when things should not be remembered. So we've been told. Does the tree remember what happened recently that everyone else has forgotten? And there's a sad look that crosses across her face, and she nods. Azimunda remembers everything. Yes, the good see. and the bad. But a story for a story. You have a story? Will you tell me a story? Together, all of you. Silas, I have many stories. I have one that I guarantee no others have heard yet. Not just you. All of you must be there. It cannot be a story of only one. For you are three. The story of, it is the not. story of what just happened? It is the story of all of us. Well, the three of us. But not just told by you, told by all. And not a story that you've lived. I can see those stories already. So you want us to just make one up? That would be fun. But every good story contains a part of truth. And she kind of leans back, falls into the, the wood of the tree, and then reappears several limbs above, um, kind of emerging out of one of the broad limbs uh, with her legs dangling over the edge and her head kind of perched down on her knees, weirdly enough. And we're going to start a story game today. Um, what I'm going to do is you'll see in the chat the round A, story one of this. Now, we could do multiple rounds. It depends on time. It depends on what people's interests are. It depends how long it takes. Well, I totally is... mis misspelled her name. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, idea is that you're going to collectively tell a story. Um, each of you will be, be participating in a, in a sort of a round turn. You each get to participate once. And in what you include in the story, it doesn't have to be detailed, but it should be enough meat because you're going to hand it on to the next person who's going to add on to that story. Now, to give you a bit of extra um, uh, prompts, I have some there. At the very end, the person who began the story will roll. And you can choose an appropriate skill. it will be rolling against a difficulty of 16, but it will be reduced if you use some of the additional elements I have suggested. And furthermore, if you reveal something about your character that hasn't been revealed before, something important and something deep that the others will be surprised to hear about, um, you'll also reduce the difficulty. Now, when you do that, um, the others will immediately know that, that is an element of your truth that you are sharing, but it will also improve the story, as Namdu requested. It's optional. You don't have to do that at all. But it should be something that you might want as an opportunity to show more of your character, something of your backstory. It doesn't have to be big. It can be a moment. It can be a person. It can be something like that. Now, a good story does include probably one, at least one person, place, or thing. Those aren't required. You could tell the story of a basket, I suppose, and not include any people in it, but that might get, make it a little harder for you to maintain the story. There are things you have to include, however. Uh, in each of these rounds, I have a set of plot points, three of them, and you have to include at least one in your story. Doesn't mean that anybody in particular has to include that one. And you could start off the story being the first person and not include any, but send off a base that you hope someone else will be able to play with. But at least one of those must be included. So if nobody's included a plot point yet, the last person's going to have to include one. In this particular round, we have conspiracy, a handoff, and a hidden weakness as part of the elements of the story. Now, in, in addition to that, you also have to include some sort of sense description. And I've listed four of them here. And you have to include at least one of these. Under the hearing category, we have growing whispers. Under the sight category, we have shifting shadows. Under the touch category, a chill that runs down someone's spine in the story. And under the smell category, a zesty citrus. So 
to, to recap, you have to include at least one plot point in the story overall. Not any one person has to include it. Someone has to include it of the three of you. You have to include at least one sense description. Again, any one person can include any of these. But um, you can only, uh, at most, uh, get credit, essentially, for one plot point and one sense description during your section. So you can't just do them all yourself. It has to be everybody participating. Uh, and again, like I said, at the very end, we'll make a roll at starting at difficulty 16. As you've included additional potential plot points and sense descriptions or personal elements of it, that will be reduced down further and further. And I may have done the math wrong, but I think it will be a, a minimum of, of, uh, of 10 by the time you've potentially you've included everything. I may be wrong there because I think I, I uh, yes, I'm definitely wrong. I missed a couple of things there, um, but it will reduce it significantly. So, again, somebody has to start, and you can start the story anywhere with the idea that you're basically handing off a bunch of possibilities to the next person to add on. Um, I'll allow a little bit of coaching for the next person, um, but really I, I want it to be everybody gets a chance to, to, to say and to add more into it. Uh, every one, each one of you will have to participate in one of the round A stories. So even if you don't start the story this time, you will start the story at some other point. And then when this is all done, and I will calculate how many successes you have, there's a range of things that Nominti can provide to you depending on how well you do. So hopefully this is fun. I know it's a little bit out of the normal, uh, but I wanted to do some sort of different challenge that didn't uh, involve, you know, fighting. <laughs> Although there's a, you know, always potential of fighting because uh, you could, I suppose, just cut down the tree and walk away, but I kind of hope you won't. But then we'll drown. <laughs> uh, it would be bad. Yeah. So does everybody understand kind of what I'm asking? Uh, I, I want to make sure you're all comfortable with it. Kind of, um, sort of. Mm. kind of, sort of. If you have questions uh, either now or during it, let me know. Uh, but basically the idea is you're crafting a story together. And it doesn't have to be true. Um, but if you if you have an element, you say, well, this, this is a true element, that's fine. And again, you can include something of your own truth, of your character's own truth, um, to stand out in there. So who would like to start the first story with some of these elements? How long do you have? How long do our rounds have to be? Like, how yeah. long do we have to? There's no particular length on it, but if you feel like you've kind of got not only the things you wanted to include and starting to just add more and more, maybe at that point you can you can let off so the next person goes. There's no particular minimum length, but a couple of minutes would be good, I think. Uh, and if you kind of want to lay out a few other background elements that other people can use, that's great too. I mean, I can start, but I mean, we're going to need a few minutes to think first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Dyslexic brain is like trying I to. I, I try to make things stand out a little bit uh, there, but uh, I apologize yeah. if, it's, if it's confusing. Um, you. Yeah. Uh, What's like. If the character in includes something true and at least a little surprising about themselves, blah, 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 be aware that the other characters will know what that element of the story is. What does that mean? So um, when when you present that element as your character, the other characters will know that that is an element about you. There's sort okay. of a mystical experience going on where you are sharing a story, but even if you frame it in terms of, and the main character uh, cheats on this exam, and that is the true element about yourself, the others will know that you cheated on an exam. <laughs> okay. It's like when a writer includes self-referential stuff, people pick up on it. Exactly. That's Those are completely optional. And the very at the very are, minimum, containing one plot point and one of the sense descriptions is all you absolutely need. Are we only talking about our own characters, or are we talking in the third person about a group of people? It can be about anything. You can make it about your characters or you can make it about completely fictional characters or historical elements. Um, this is an opportunity to to add something to the world if you want and make up a historical element. Now, not all three of the characters might know that. So one person might start off with a historical element and the other person says, well, actually, 
it was a marriage that they were involved with, not a war. And so uh, there's no requirement that the story be true in total. Oh, no. What? Everyone, everyone's screens just uh, blipped and then came back. Yeah, I think we're okay. <laughs> Are you still alive? I'm not sure what that was, but I think we're still okay. Lag. Some sort of reset. Um, the universe went through a tunnel. <laughs> okay. <Aww>. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, just give me a minute and I can start something off. Okay. In the meantime, uh, Namti gathers a few of the fruits together and a few of the uh, the larger seeds. It doesn't have to kind of crack open the seed, but instead it sort of gently cracks apart in her hands, almost as though it's opening itself for her. Um, what's what's in that? I had some earlier years. I took the earpiece out so I could focus on trying to come up with the story, and then I realized I can hear Mark from the other other room anyways. <laughs> Uh, Nam Namti says, uh, uh, it is the very essence of Azamunta. It is one of their gifts. But the apples are fine. Thanks. Oh, good to know. If eaten on their own. But uh, she kind of cracks one of the apples, uh, or actually, yeah, it sort of breaks it in two. Uh, they're, they're crisp enough for that. Dips it in the milk and hands it to you. This will make it fine. All right. And I'll have some of the apple. Okay. And it's very, 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 very bitter. But with the little essence of the milk that's placed on it, it sort of cuts through that uh, and and gives you this, this warm sensation. And you feel like, even though you've only eaten a, a bite or two, you feel full. Very satisfied. And very, almost rested. Somebody needs to ferment these. They only grow here. And there's only a few of them. Okay. Well, thanks. Azamunta is eager to hear your story. Yep. Silas was just waiting until uh, people stopped talking. <laughs> um, wow. Silas will... Uh, <laughs> uh, Silas will also... Uh, uh, yeah, I think he's got one spell slot left. Uh, he'll use uh, Major Illusion to uh, go along with the story. Okay. Although it'll go along for about 10 minutes, and I think it's done. But um, mm -hmm. And he'll do that for everyone's section as long as it lasts, anyways. Um, okay. Well... Kind of winging this, but um, uh, he shows a room. Looks like a royal room, very well appointed. Probably a place that he has never seen before, so it's probably not appointed. It's just how he thinks a royal room would look. Um, lots of money. Uh, and he said, um, it is a bright morning outside, but dark within the room when the knave came to see queen. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, he walks over to her and says, the plan has begun. They will be dead by morning. Here, have an orange. It's a zesty citrus fruit. <laughs> uh, no, uh, although a uh, a a butler does bring, like a uh, serving person, uh, does bring in her breakfast, which happens to include an orange, but he doesn't actually use that uh, the catchphrase because that's just a minor thing 
I will say that each of these things should be important somehow in the story, not just in the background mentioned. Yep. Uh, he, uh, she says, are you sure this must be done? Yes, my lady. Uh, the knave says, looking evilly, twirling his mustache. Mostly Silas does over the top kind of stuff. So, um, will the king hear of this? Not until it is too late. You know, it must be done. And he leaves the room with a smile on his face that everyone can clearly see in the illusion, um, playing with the camera angles. Uh, the room itself is dark, uh, but um, anyone feel like continue? <laughs> so just to make it sure, uh, clear, I want to know which elements you are including specifically. And I realize I didn't, I didn't read out all three of the plot points for those who might be watching or not able to read that. The first one is conspiracy. The second one is a handoff uh, that is a handoff that is misdelivered. And the third one is a hidden weakness, a flaw in a person, place, or thing that changed the story somehow. So uh, just to be clear, which ones are you including? Conspiracy. Yeah, it sounds uh, like conspiracy, all right. And actually, as he leaves, I'd say uh, I'll wreck for the little bit. Um, he has a letter in his hand, which is obviously a, uh, a thing of attention, but not calling super attention to it right now. Uh, and he takes it as he leaves. Okay. So you've got the, the, the one plot point already taken advantage of. You will need, someone will need to do one of the sense descriptions. And again, you can include something personal of yourself in the story, which further reduces the difficulty. So who would like to pick up the story of the, the plot with the queen? Ing. And it doesn't have to be done told in a storytelling style. You can describe it in loose terms or kind of in structural terms rather than having to do sort of a line-by-line -line story or as you're telling it. You're welcome to do so, but I don't want you to feel like you have to. I, I can go. Okay. The... What was it? The knave? Uh... Uh, and uh, finds uh, in the town. It's where uh, someone would contact someone about illegal activities and uh, to deliver the letter he's carrying. Uh, and um it's I had a sentence and it's gone. Uh, happens. Uh uh something in the shadows and, uh, down the, the the space uh and he thinks that he's been caught so he's uh, he runs uh, away uh, and tries to find a place to hide. Contribution. Okay. Um, was there a plot point, a sense description, or something about Annie which you were including? Um, there wasn't anything about Annie, uh, but it would be the handoff and the shifting shadows. Okay. So that's a bonus for the handoff and the shifting shadows is your, your sensory description. So the nice thing about this particular point is you've now completed the base of the challenge plus one bonus. So whatever you want to include now, uh, Nax, as uh, Medric, is essentially bonus. Um, again, you okay. can have the one thing about Nedric, which would be one point, 
the uh, another one of the plot points, in this case, hidden weakness is the only one left. And you can include one of the other sensory descriptions if you wanted to. All right. Uh, bring this to a, a rousing conclusion. Does it have to be those exact sensory? Does it have to be like those exact sensory descriptions? Those are the challenge ones. Yep. They don't have to be exactly those words. If you want to describe it with something else, but it is like actually growing whispers, yeah. that's fine. You don't have to use those words. Although in the end, uh, where was like the guy? Two, if... I will. I will ask you which things you included to make sure. Hidden, like just in a dark room, or can I elaborate on that? Elaborate on that? Yeah, if it wasn't established, you can certainly uh, elaborate more. I think all all that uh, Marie had said was that they they went to somewhere to hide. Okay. They've been spotted, so they have to find a place to lie low. All right. Okay, so I apologize ahead of time. This is going to be like fragmented as hell because I'm very much not a storyteller. <laughs> it doesn't have to be elaborate. Um, you can think of your favorite movie or a book and you can use that plot directly if you want to as well. But right now we have a plot to kill the, some, I think it was to kill the king. The queen is in on it. This knave is... No, it was, they will be dead by morning. Right, so, 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 the king doesn't know. Right. So it could be anybody that they're going to kill. You can bring in that aspect of it. We have a knave who's carrying the, right. the letter but's been caught and is now hiding somewhere. Right. So the knave. I didn't hear that. Sorry. Nope. Does, does he have a name? It was just the knave, the queen, and the king were the only things mentioned. Right. You can add a name if you like. Um, so Medrick will say, um, yeah, I'm not sure what the name is, but I'm assuming it sounds bad. So let's just give this guy a name. He's. <laughs> Was that Bruce? So Bruce is hiding. Okay. He thinks he's been caught, but he's not sure if he's been caught. But just in case, he doesn't want to come out of hiding. Then there's whispers coming to the to the right, and Allie rounds around somewhere, and he feels like he should be away from where these whispers are. So he does that. And he goes down some stairs that's at the bottom of the stairs and I so just in case last part goes down the stairs and then what and he opens the door that sewers which is like great decided it's a good place to move around and possibly pop up on some other part of the town. then he slips and he falls in the water, first of all. But then, like, something's moving, something touches him. The chill runs down his spine. So he gets out of there as quickly as he can. And back on the surface, or I mean, like, the not... The, the ledge by the water, he gets back on that. And he's covered in leeches. It's really disgusting. <laughs> uh, just as a note, uh, major illusion includes stuff like smell, so you can all smell the sewer while he's describing it. Awesome! <laughs> and having recently been in a sewer, probably has uh, some pretty vivid uh, depictions of what that looks like. <laughs> okay. Um, so I heard uh, uh, the uh, whispers, so I heard the sound. Growing whispers. Yeah. And I saw a, well, you can only have one of the sense descriptions to give bonuses, but I did see the chill run down the spine as well. So um, still only one bonus on that one. I think quite a minimum difficulty anyway. So. Um, well, again, I, I didn't calculate that quite correctly, but currently I'm looking at uh, only bonus of plus four. So it's not quite the minimum difficulty. Difficulty 12 then. Uh, a conspiracy handoff. So conspiracy and and and, and uh, shifting shadows were the two minimum ones you had to complete the challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they don't count. They it? don't. No, they don't count. They're okay. minimum requirements. And then handoff, which was a bonus, and either 
uh, growing whispers or a chill runs down his spine, either one of those, only one of them counts because you have two sense descriptions for one person. But yeah. that's a difficulty of 12. Uh, I will say that uh, because of the illusion, I'll give, I'll give you advantage. Uh, and it is, in fact, uh, uh, Silas who's going to begin off. What skill are you going to use? Uh, performance. Makes sense. Okay, the advantage was definitely important. Uh, so that is a full success. So with the extra added uh, smells and illusions of places that presumably Numpty has never seen, um, she seems to be delightful, uh, delighted at the story, uh, and asks all kinds of questions following up about who the king or who the queen and king were, and who well, who was going to die, and you know did did the did the uh, the you know what happened when the letter wasn't delivered and so forth, but kind of uh, digging into that and has all of her own suggestions, most of which don't make any sense, and each of you sort of realize that what Namti knows and presumably what Azamunda knows is all secondhand. She's never been off this island. She's never been away from Azamunda. So only through the story she's heard from other people does she piece together the things that happen on land. But... Hear the be... story. Story. <laughs> oh, true. But at the same time, um, there's still a keenness and understanding. There's still a, an intelligence there as she pieces it together. And in the end, kind of has this whole story, which, weirdly to all three of you, has a sort of ring of truth. Almost as though you all question at the end, maybe there was a queen who was plotting the death that the king would have liked to known about, and maybe the knave did fail that up. And it leaves you thinking that maybe this story actually happened. He leaves the uh, producer notes and uh, <laughs> asks where, where the, uh, the, the rock dance-off is going to be in the, uh, in the show. <laughs> so, uh, now that you kind of know what this is like, we've got two more rounds. Uh, one will be led by Medrick, the other one by Annie. I'll give you the story prompts for the second round. Um, so, uh, again, uh, you have to include the one of the plot points and at least one of the sense descriptions. Somebody has to include it, but you can include the others as options. Uh, each of you can only include one plot point and one sense description at most in your stories to get bonuses for it. And again, you can include something true about yourself. So the plot points this time include the call of nature. Someone or something suddenly has an urgent need for relief. So this could be a call of nature. <laughs> they don't have to be dark. Uh, it includes, it possibly includes beast, a dangerous wild animal or creature threatens, or maybe it's a whole group of them that threatens. And a dark secret, the dark side of someone's life or the dark history of an object or a place comes out and changes the story. How? One of the following sense descriptions should be included at least. If we're hearing the sound of smashing pottery, for sight, bright streaks. And again, these can be interpreted pretty broadly. Uh, for touch, the abrupt feeling of being naked and exposed which could literally be naked and exposed, or simply uh, a spotlight shines on somebody as they're sneaking around, or maybe you thought you were in a good place, but a lion comes up behind you. There's all kinds of potentiality. And finally, for the smell, the smell of chipped wood mulch. So given those are your potential things to start with. And, uh, you know, again, this is a collaborative effort. Only two of these are actually required, so don't feel like you have to include a lot of them. These are really meant to be inspirational story starting points. And including something real about your own character helps to flavor the story. So who would like to start this one off? Marie or? I would like this one. Perfect. Go for it. Um, so Annie will set the scene as a elaborate party. Uh, it is, in real life, uh, it is something that happened, uh, like, it's her birthday party. And so, illusions, but it's, it's not as good an illusion spell, so it's just visual. <laughs> uh, uh, she'll uh, try to excuse herself because she needs to go to the washroom. Uh, and people keep stopping her. Uh, and then she finally gets out and 
uh, on her way there, she hears something uh, in a direction that nobody should be that way. Uh, she hears something smash. Okay, that's a great thrilling start to the story. I like it. Uh, and we had in that one something real, so her birthday party. Uh, call of nature, she really had to go and had that annoying thing of the, the, the bathroom's over there and there's 50 people who want to say hello before I get to the door. And then finally... And in a convention, everybody wants pictures. <laughs> yeah, if you've ever been to a convention <laughs> and you've ever been in costume and suddenly you're like the really most popular person in the center of, the, of everything and you're like... Yeah, I shouldn't have had that extra Diet Coke. Um, then uh, then we're in a problem. And finally, the hearing smashing pottery. So right out of the gate, you've already accomplished the goal, and you have one bonus point. Congratulations. So who wants to go next? If you want to go next, I can finish it. No, I'm, I could go next. I'm just trying to think of ideas. Mm. And they don't have to be elaborate or fancy. And they don't have to be first person either. So, Although both okay. of you know that indeed, at a very, very fancy birthday party, Annie really, really had to go. <laughs> did Annie <laughs> specify that it was her, like herself? Annie did not specify that, but you know that was true and drawn from her own experience. You just okay. <laughs> you kind of get the sense that stories revolve around this tree, and that by being in this okay. presence, the story takes on a bit more reality. All right. Yeah, I'll go next. Okay. Mm. Right, and the girl turns around. Annie, what was the girl's name? I didn't give give her a name. I just said the princess. Yes. Well, I'll call her uh, Peach Princess. Wait, <laughs> should I rename that? Is that copyright? No, I don't know. <laughs> it's just another Pooch the princess. princess Pooch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Pooch the princess turns around abrupt and abruptly to see what smashed the face or glass or whatever smashed. Oh no, it was a window. Or jumped through the window for whatever reason. Maybe you just smelled food, smell the food at the party and wanted some, but it's it's low up. And it's a bear. And seeing a bear in a palace is obviously a bad thing. So Pinch food what would I princess again? <laughs> anyway, so Princess Pinch runs away chasing her. She runs and she runs. Right, and there's windows and and it just looks like bright bright streaks as she's running by all the windows and seeing the light. And eventually she turns the corner, goes into the garden, and Okay, I think the break the bear's gone. Is it gone? Silas, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh it broke up a little bit there, but I think I got the essence here. Okay. Uh, I I did hear uh, a beast, a large beast. That was the bear. And I did hear uh, the bright streaks of light flowing through the... the uh, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of imagining... Running uh, he was so fast, like brightly, brightly, brightly. Yep, and, I, and I'm kind of imagining these you know, beautiful, like maybe uh, stained glass windows. So there's a whole bunch of different varied lights as well. And was there anything true about Medric that went into this story? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. No, that's fine. There was some of the last story, but that was never brought up. <laughs> um, was there something in the last story? You said there was something in the last story? Because if there was something true, then the others would know about it. Yeah. Uh, the leaders one time when he was younger, and it's like, yeah, this is like nice and cool and relaxing. And it's like, ah, fuck, I'm covered by the bleachers. And that's why he doesn't really like water at all. <laughs> Or okay. creepy crawly things. Okay, it's imp it's important to point that out because the others okay. now know that and know. Yeah, that I just didn't this, want to interrupt. <laughs> this uh, no, that's 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 my fault. Sorry about that. But that was a, a truth 
Um, and the, the roll was well in hand anyway at that point, but that would also have given a plus one to that. So, okay. But yeah, now a princess, right? And the princess, her name was Pooch, then it was Pinch, because Mitter forgot the, that his own princess, own princess. I, so it can I, be I, anything that starts with that starts with P. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is the princess's party. I mean, it's, I'm assuming it's a coming of age party or something. Uh, so there's celebrations going on all over the castle. So when she is chased into the garden uh, by the bear, they're all there celebrating <laughs> and saying, oh, hello, it's the princess. Yeah. <laughs> now the princess has a secret and she doesn't want to do it, but she has to defend her people. So she turns when she's in the middle of the, the, uh, the group uh, to find the bear uh, is charging after her again. Actually, no, it's stopping from the sky. It's a bear. <laughs> um, <laughs> Reaches deep in, inside herself secret lessons she was taught over the past few years. And the bear as a shadow mixed with bright streaks, because I wanted to use that anyways. Um, reach out and touch the bear and you see her her eyes go dark and the shadows get deeper and the sun almost disappears uh as in front of everybody she drains the life out of the bear and it collapses dead and then she looks around and realizes that now everybody knows her secret and I took a dark turn. she's a wizard <laughs> Burn. No, wait. You're a necromancer, Harry. <laughs> I was the rumor that was gonna was gonna give her a surprise present. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you left the story to me and the dark secret. So I did hear dark secret. Um, bright streaks had already been used. Smashing pottery had already been used. Yeah. Um, no, it's just a dark secret. Okay. Uh, and that isn't about Silas history, but it's about his expected future. So that may or may not affect anything. So what part is specifically Silas is, uh, that sometime it's going to come out, uh, as to, uh, what he's an actual member of, uh, something that the town does not like, and he may need to use his power to, uh, help the town. So that may or may not actually give a point. But uh, it is something that they would know that he fears or that, well, that he fears and that he feels is going to happen at some point. He can't keep the secret forever. Okay, I like that. And, and yes, the other two would realize that when, when Silas is talking about how this princess has to use this dark power in front of her but is afraid of what everybody is going to think about that, um, I also will say that uh, that also includes the abrupt feeling of feeling naked and exposed. Is that that yep. is the the yep. feeling of having to be there? So I'm I'm going to include that as well. Um, so that's another uh, another sensory one. So according to my calculations, that is seven points of bonus. So the difficulty is nine. Hey. The difficulty is lowered again by one point for the illusion that's going on. Not quite as good as the the full sensory illusion created before. So for Annie, what skill is Annie using to tell the story with a difficulty nine? Sleight of hand. Please, <laughs> tools. Uh, She's using them like puppets. If, if you can make a case for <laughs> it, I'm, I'm not going to dispute it, but uh, as long as there's a reasonable case for it. Um, but, this one does have a lot of truth to it, so can I use persuasion? Sure. I think that's a genuine emotion here. So persuasion it is. Difficulty nine. Cool. Uh, I have a plus eight. There you go. You still could have rolled a one, 
which still would have succeeded technically. But you didn't. You rolled yeah. uh, a uh, a nine. You got a seventeen. Uh, Namti uh, Namti seems uh, very much taken with this story, and you, you, she kind of starts to run around the different limbs of the tree, and you can kind of see her folding up and moving some of the vines and the flowers, almost to make it look like you're standing in that courtyard. Uh, and that the flowers are substitutes in for people. And she kind of even puppets the, the flowers a little bit as, and turns them as if their heads turning in, in a gape and aghast at what's going on here. Uh, and then at one point moves over to one of the, you can see a, 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 a small twig and, and it's kind of still green. And uh, she kind of runs across the space and as if the energy has hit the small twig and she kind of bends the twig down as if it has now died like the bear. And then let's go, and it pops back up quite fine. But she's super pleased with that story. All right, one more round I think will be done for today. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. I will say that Roll20 has a peculiarity that when you add things, they're not in order. I don't know why. Uh, where are we here? Uh, round A, story number three. So for the third story, this one will be led by Medric. You have to include one of the following plot points. Retribution. Someone was wronged and now seeks revenge, but for what reason? How do they know? How do they want to do it? And can they succeed? Or maybe it's about fortune. Some element of chance takes control of the narrative, but was it good luck or bad luck? Or a sneeze. Somebody lets loose with a sneeze, maybe at a very bad moment. How does this change the story? So it's not just a casual sneeze. It has to have some impact. And one of the following sense descriptions. Under hearing, you hear distant revelry. There's a party going on somewhere. Uh, you hear, you uh, see swirls of dust. You have the touch, the sensation of cold steel pressing up against a person. And the smell, nervous sweat. So those are the elements of the story uh, that you're going to be including. And you can kind of start the, the wheels turning right now. Okay. Uh, Nax, you're going to be leading this one. Are you? Uh, do you right. want to take a moment, or do you want to go for it? Yeah, I'll have a few more seconds. Okay. Just like get the story elements in order, kind of. Sure. Or as in order as possible. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think distracting. That, one, that one is kind of copyrighted as well. <laughs> okay. So for those of you who are wondering where I pulled these ideas, I actually have um, an old thing I picked up years ago at a convention called Story Path Cards. And that's where the major plot points have been coming from. I've kind of taken them, adapted them slightly, and chosen three random cards. And then the other things, the sensory descriptions are part of a, of a lot of uh, uh, cards called, uh, I think that was the tool cards? No, not the tool cards set. I backed a, backed a bunch of Kickstarters. But the neat thing about each of these cards is they're packed with information. This is just one segment of the card. They also include a, a set of random numbers. There's a set of random names, a set of random places. There's a fundamental element. There's a color. There's a bunch of other things. So uh, I, I, I forget the name of them offhand, unfortunately. And there's no, they're, they're neat cards, but they're double-sided, which means there's no name on the cards at all. Uh, except okay. for the fact that it was produced by... Um, I think it's uh, Larsonous Designs, I believe, is the is the LLC that created them. But I've been wanting an excuse to use these, and these are wonderful kind of random prompts to to pull in. So, and that's nice. where I got the sense descriptions for these ones. So, are you ready to Predict start? Predict story now. Awesome. All right. Let's hear Medric's story. All right. So, uh, I, I mean, I'm the main character. Let's call him. Uh, Names. Ted. Let's call him. Let's call him Ken. All right. So Ken was a fighter and a nice big battle had been won and everybody was at the tavern in the town. And then there was a distant revelry, nearby revelry. There was revelry all over the place, actually. And name, yeah, Ken was in Grunt. He had a nice kind of honey drink, took a sip, chatted with somebody, then he went to grab his drink again, and it was gone. Ken was pissed, right? Because, like, that's what happens when somebody takes your drink, especially after a long battle. So, found and saw this other guy with his drink in his hand, like...
Uh, I think it's you're cutting out a little bit. So I, oh, last I heard was he saw someone with his drink in his hand. Yeah, so somebody else took his drink. So then Ken was pissed and wanted some... He was wrong and he wanted, he wanted some revenge. So he just shoved the other guy out a little bit. And the other guy shoved back. And then... Yeah. And it's going to be thrown. And that's where I'm, I'll leave it off. Okay, so we've got our retribution. And we've got uh, the revelry, uh, distant and close. I'll, I'll give that. Basically, the entire town is, is uh, celebrating. I'll, I'll allow that one. So the basics have been covered. Was there an, a truth ab about Medric in there? Probably something that happened in the past. <laughs> well, it, it would be something specific. In the Here's story. a random bar. What? It would be something specific, like a, a, a bar fight that meant something to him or a bar fight that he started or something like that. Um, and they started, but, but where he realized that little thing, like somebody taking your accidentally, probably, in retrospect, probably it sucked to get that much work out of it. Like, it's easier to talk things through. Like, that's where you would learn that, learn that lesson, lesson, probably. Not that he didn't win the fight, but I guess it's, it's not my decision anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so do we want to say then that it was the fact that that Medrick was a little embarrassed that the character jumped so quickly to fighting? I, I didn't hear you, but I saw you. Thank you. What? Yeah. You're, you're cutting out a lot. I'm not sure if it's on my end or not, but... Oh, crap. I can hear him because I hear him fine. Yeah, yeah okay. So it's on my end. Pardon me well, for that. Yeah. No, unfortunately, nothing I can do about that. Um, but uh, okay, so so okay, I will include that as a as a uh, one bonus, something something true about Medric. And so the rest of you realize that um, maybe it's a cliche that a lot of people would have about Kamar uh, or the Ignean fighters in general that they are literally hot headed. Um, but Medric feels a little embarrassed about that moment, uh, and and kind of has realized in retrospect and looking back that uh, he can do better. All right. Who wants to take the story from here? Uh, did you want to, Marie, or I can go? I can go. Oh, okay. And you have your basics already, because we have Retribution and we have the Distant Revelry. So now it's all bonus. Um, so they start to fight, and... In the process, someone gets pushed into a shelf that hasn't been in a while, in a while so there's dust everywhere. <laughs> uh, nice. And then they, everybody, <laughs> this, this bar is not up to code. Needs <laughs> 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 <You're> cleaning. <laughs> to the point that, like, Everything stops because nobody can stop can stop sneezing. <laughs> okay. All right, I took advantage of those two things being. In the yeah, I mean, it does make sense. sense. <laughs> <laughs> I had to. Um. Yeah, that's addition to it. Okay. Um, is there a truth about uh, about uh, about uh, not Marie? <laughs> a truth about Annie that's in that story? Um, I don't think there would be much. Okay, it's it's not necessary, but I no, want to make sure. In, in the fighting, we fairly specific in describing it. So. Cause and a lot of our anything. Okay. Um, um, again, it's it's a little quite a bit broken up on my side, but I think I understood what you said there, that she was very specific about the fighting because she's had a lot of training and sparring uh, up to this point, which probably surprises the other two. While she's shown herself to be competent in fighting, um, to know that it's it's not just by the the learning on the road, it's that she specifically has been trained by a very competent fighter. Uh, to to do that, so the the fight gets so from 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 Medrick's sort of drunken brawl, the fight turns into a very specific parry, thrust, swing, slide under, kick the leg, fly, lots of dust flies up. 
just like imagine like the blip time. Going yeah, it suddenly becomes a Jet Li movie. <laughs> exactly. Okay. More describing it, it the way that like her instructor would be telling her what to do. Okay. All right. I definitely would count that as, as something now that the other two are aware of uh, and knowing that she had this, this incredible instructor as well. Okay, so let's bring the story home. Okay, uh, This uh, the following part has nothing to do about Silas whatsoever. <laughs> uh, just to let you know. Um, so the fight stops for a moment, but only for a moment before another wave of sneezes lets off. Uh, and uh, sorry, uh, but only for a moment. Uh, and Ken, that was his name. Yeah. Uh, you could. Who can smell the nervous sweat come up of Ken? Uh, and the fight only stops for a moment before it, it starts again. Fists are flying. Uh, thankfully, uh, there's no weapons drawn. Power gets in trouble because everybody's angry at Ken now. Uh, but thanks to the swirls of dust, it actually proves to be quite fortunate. And he takes good luck uh, and crawls out the door in the midst of the the uh, the the dust and now sawdust from broken chairs <laughs> uh, and gets the heck out of the, uh, out of the bar, uh, dusts himself off and walks down the street, whistling calmly and walking <laughs> very slow. Nice. The end. <laughs> Edric's about to say, that's not at all how it happened. But that's like, no, 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 that, that, that was Ken. That was totally Ken. <laughs> all right. Can you believe it? So I did hear the using a, a lucky fortune in there. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for that. That was a bit of a scratch, yeah. but I see now how I feel where you have to come up with names on the spot. Uh, there was the nervous sweat, and yes, the nervous sweat as well. So, according to my math, that gives you guys a, pl a, a an eight point bonus. Um, so the difficulty this time is only going to be eight. Uh, and this is from uh, Medric. So what is Medric doing to help, uh, you know, bring the story home? What's the, what skill are you going to try to, to uh, bring it all together? To make it more believable, pissed off Ken wants to use intimidation. Sure. That's absolutely okay. great. <laughs> 20. Non-natural 20. Non-natural 20. Uh, yes, as, as you kind of, uh, in fact, uh, Numpty kind of, you uh, reels back with the the intimidating gaze that that uh, Medric gives this serious face and in fact uh probably Silas and and uh, Annie as well um he's gotten a little bit angry about it so maybe what they say about Ignians might actually be true that they have a little bit of a hot head but at the same time you recognize it's Medric and you can you kind of after putting on that that uh, thing a smile probably breaks up across his face as the as the story comes to a satisfying conclusion and this time uh namti has been kind of running around and with every every description of a of a, of a fight uh, uh, a blow being struck kind of seems to be trying to portray both people kind of running around and both the person punching and also the person getting hit flying across the space uh and getting into it and then cheers at the end when ken gets away not really sure if it was appropriate to cheer there, but she seemed to uh, enjoy the story tremendously. Uh, and with that, uh, the the uh, she she uh, kind of sighs uh, happily, uh, sits down. Those were very good stories. Thank you, both I and Azamunda appreciate your stories so much. Not enough people have great stories like that, and I know that your stories are going to be great. Azamunda can already sense that. There are going to be some hard times ahead, but I know you'll do well. There'll be tough choices. And she kind of looks over towards uh, the still prone form of Regalesta. And there will be some allies and some enemies. There'll be some brave deeds and even some thrilling fights. But we know you're going to be okay. And for that, We'd like to ask you a favor, if we can. It's a bit of a, a bit of a big favor, but it's important to both of us. 
as Amunda will be gone from the world soon. As will I. There's no need to be sad about it, though. We've lived for a very long time, and all things pass in time. But where there's passing, there's also new life. And she reaches back, and the vines kind of gently lay down uh, one of those large almond-shaped but coconut-styled uh, 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 things that she's been sort of feeding you a little bit. And then in the other hand, uh, three apples that seem like they should be too big for her hands. Her hands seem smaller than what they should balance there, but she seems to have them delicately uh, uh, sat there. We'd like to give you these. We'd like you to plant as a seed and feed it with these my gifts and she hands the first the the uh, coconut the almond coconut and then the three apples handing each of you one of the apples now it can't just be placed anywhere azamunda or that which comes next requires a place where the seawater washes up but then drains away a place where the light of Ignis can shine down on the child and to hear children playing nearby. A place where no smoke will ever cross it so it need not fear the fire. Beside the seed should be the pearl of a great silver mollusk and its shell should be wrapped around to give the seed time to grow. These three bitter apples should be placed nearby to be consumed by the growing new form. But a bite has to be taken out of each one of them, a bite from each of you, and you must chew and swallow this bite. I thought you said they were poison. They are. This is a tough sacrifice, I know. It will not kill you, but it will probably make you ill. But in that giving of energy, in that giving of yourself, you will ensure that that which grows will be strong and good. It must be placed where it can be loved, but where it can also be alone. A tree needs time to think, you know. Do you have a map such a place by any chance? That or will directions? be for you to find. All I know is the needs that Azamunda and that which comes next will need. And as soon as it sprouts, you must give it a name, and it must know the name. This is a lot to ask of you, but you've given us such joy, and I can see long along in your path so many great things and the new life which comes forth, brought by you, will be wondrous. So can I ask this of you? Can we ask this of you? I can't see my uh, but first... Sorry, you broke up first what? I, I can't see why not, but I have to ask you something. Of course. Why are you going to pass away soon? Are you sick? No. Something afflicting you? It is just the way of time. Things do not naturally live forever. Except maybe the gods, and even then, some things are in doubt. But do not be sad, as Amunda and I have lived for a very long time. We have seen kingdoms rise and fall. We have seen explorers come, and entire towns and cities be built, and then fall to nothing for new explorers to come, and build new cities, and on and on. We have seen wonderful inventions and boats travel. And that which comes again, we'll see the next range of those. But we will not be passing quickly. Not by your reckoning, but by ours. 
Uh, another question. The person, entity, we were discussing earlier with the initials. E. Is there any... Can you give us any tips as to how he can be stopped? Or defeated for good? The one which you speak of grew very, very powerful. And only the combined forces of the gods and their many followers were able to defeat them last time. I don't know if that will happen again. Things are different this time. The people he once knew, aside from a few, and she looks down towards Regalesta, aside from a few are all gone. They too rose up against him, so perhaps what's left will also do so. But this will not be the force of one or two or three, or the force of one or two or three leading other forces. In time. Is she going to be okay? And I'll look down at less two, less than two. She has lost much, but her life is still there. It is strong. It will take time for her to adjust to her new form of living. What is she? What, what race do you know? Her people are gone now, but they were once called Athlonians. She who she was. Are any of us who we were when we've undergone change? She, more than most, has changed and changed again. I think now that she is more like what she was before she changed. Mm. The seed, how soon must it be planted? Within your lifetime, maybe sooner. Hopefully within so, your yeah. lifetimes, too. Within your lifetimes, maybe sooner. Yeah. Hopefully sooner, because that which comes will be good to you. If this, are we bound to the tree that sprouts? I already have one who I cannot serve two. Azamunda and that which comes does not need people aside from me. You are not bound to it, but you might say that it will owe its life to you. And we shall see what we can do. Then you will accept my my request? Yes. Yep. I'm sorry. I will do what I can. As shall I. Your stories were great, and I look forward to hearing more, but for now, perhaps we should rest. And in fact, by now you've noticed that the sun has dipped just to the edge of the horizon. Time has passed an entire evening of telling stories and having fun and laughing and enjoying the time so much differently from all the, the, the terrible turmoil you've been in facing recently, from all the fights and challenges, a piece of calm. And that's where I'm going to end it for tonight. I will uh, bestow upon you Namti's gifts for next week. Cool beans. Uh, I hope you had uh, fun with the, the odd little story idea. I know I kind of sprung it on to you, but I tried to give you some assistance there. I'll try to make it a little more readable if I do it in the future. There are more rounds of this if you'd like to try it again, but uh, uh, perhaps that will be with you. Do it as an actual, actual handout, not a, like, in the journal. Mm. That way I can expand it. That's very fair. Yeah, I thought about that afterwards after I typed all those in. It's like, oh, crap, I should have. Oh, well. <laughs> but, yes, uh, I will I will definitely. Yep, yep, I, I have. Like I said, I have another round of this. I don't think we're necessarily going to be doing it next week. 
Um, but perhaps when that which, uh, that which comes matures, uh, maybe you'll have an opportunity to do it again. Or maybe we'll find another place to put this. Uh, but uh, I thought it was, I, again, I, I was looking for an interesting and different kind of challenge for you guys to, uh, to face off with. Um, but that's it for, for uh, me today. Any last thoughts uh, before we head out? Okay. Um, thinking of it, can we, do you have like a written version of those instructions? Because I could not keep up handwriting them. Yes. Yeah, I same. Have, <laughs> I, I will have a handout for those. Okay, cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you to, if you've been watching this, either on uh, youtube.com slash ENCAF1 or on uh, twitch.tv slash ENCAF1. We will be back again next week. I realize I didn't update the date. <laughs> so you'll see when we come to the end credits, you'll see them suddenly change. Uh, but we are intended to come back. We stream on Sundays at 3 o'clock uh, Atlantic time. Um, for a couple of hours to enjoy the game. So uh, thanks once again for, for joining us, and uh, we'll see you again, or you'll see us, I guess, again. We'll see each other again next week. <laughs>